Why were we put here? I think everyone wants to know, why were we put here? Why are we on Earth? My purpose in life is to, um, to live a normal life, to, to be uh, a citizen, a productive citizen. Intentar pasar por la vida de la manera más desapercibida posible. I don't fully know why I'm here, but I enjoy that. I enjoy knowing that because then that creates endless possibilities for myself. I would like to make a difference, even if it's only in one life, I'd prefer to do more. Because I think the meaning of life, in my opinion, is to find something that you're passionate about and use that passion to make the world around you a better place. Well, again, good morning and uh, welcome this morning. Um, I, I want to begin by just inviting you um, to, to join a conversation, a journey of sorts. As over the next seven weeks, as we navigate, along with about 800, 815, I believe is the latest number I've heard, churches in the Chicagoland area, so all around us, as we explore together, talk about, get in conversations about these questions, questions about who God is, questions about what what our faith means, questions about what is the meaning of life. Now, I know many of you have already even launched into some of these conversations over the last week or maybe coming up this week. Some of you have been meeting in, in groups in homes or at the library or coffee shops or wherever it is. And, and really, one of our objectives, our hopes in this whole thing is that these conversations would go outside of these walls. That this is be something that we talk about or continue to ask ourselves about in our around the dining room table or with coworkers or with friends or family or whatever that looks like. The, the, the people that God has put around us. There's a couple things just as we launch into this series that I want to take a few brief moments to acknowledge at the outset here that I think are important. One, just as a bit of a disclaimer. These, these are topics and questions that we're going to look at together that I think are so big and, and so important that it's, it's impossible for us to kind of cover these comprehensively in, in the context of the next 25 to 30 minutes, right? There's no one 30-minute sermon that is going to look at all angles and perspectives and viewpoints on all of these topics. And so I just, I wanna say that, I wanna acknowledge that out front. Secondly though, in, in light of that, I also think that it's important to, to say that from my perspective or my goal in all of this is going to be do a, my best attempt to get at the heart of the matter from, from a biblical worldview. So to look at what God teaches us on this, and even that, I mean, People have made this their life work. People have written volumes and volumes on these questions. And so even what we're going to cover this morning will be extremely truncated, right? It's going to be just kind of a getting at the central themes that we see. Thirdly, then, I, I think it's also important to recognize that each of us approaches these questions from a unique perspective. We all come at this with our own thoughts and our own backgrounds, our experiences, our, what we've studied in the past, our own faith and beliefs, and, and the viewpoints that we carry into the conversation. So some of you here this morning are approaching these questions, like, like myself, from a Christian worldview that holds the Bible as the source of authority for life and for truth and for understanding and for meaning, purpose. And, and others of you may be here this morning and you would totally disagree with me on that point. And that's, that's, that's okay. Additionally, I think we also approach each of these questions with varying degrees of resolution or confidence as we come into it. For instance, you, you may be a follower of Jesus and you might be here this morning and you are still wrestling with understanding or, or um, living out the implications of each of these questions. And on the flip side of that, you, you may be here this morning and be agnostic, for instance, and, and feel like you have a lot of resolution as it relates to these matters. And so it's not only our faith backgrounds and perspectives, but we're all coming with varying degrees of, 
of resolution. Or we might be like the, the man in the video or the woman in the video. I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, I don't know that you can fully know the answers to these questions, and, and, and I'm okay with that. Like, I like the unknown. It, it leads to infinite possibilities. So, so maybe that describes where you're at the, this morning. My point in all of that is to acknowledge or to recognize that we come to these we come to each one of these questions with a unique set of lenses. And I think it's important that as we start this conversation that we're honest with ourselves in that regard and that we recognize that and honor that in each other. And so no matter where you're coming from, what, what set of lenses you look at these questions from, I want you to know this morning that I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. I, I enjoy this sort of thing. I enjoy these types of conversations. And, and I hope my desire and my heart behind this entire series for each of us is that these questions and that these conversations and those that ensue outside of these walls, that for each one of us, that this would help us understand more about who God is. That it would help us understand more about how much he loves each and every one of us. And, and, and that would help us understand more about how we can relate to him. So in light of all of that, I want to begin by considering this first question. Does life have a purpose? Now imagine for a moment that you're undertaking all this and you look and you've got like a, a, a 25 to 30 minute window to cover the question, does life have a purpose? <laughs> there's, there's enough challenge in that alone. And then you listen to all of the responses that we just heard and you recognize the varying degrees of viewpoints and and how people um, understand and articulate their own sense of purpose. In fact, I would, I would invite you this morning, if you can, think back to the very first time you ever processed this question. When was the first time in life that you felt like you had a moment when you were asking yourself, why am I here? Like, what, what is the point of all of this? When I was a middle school student, many of you know I grew up in a small town in rural Ohio and I had a paper route. Um, and, and so after school, on school days we could deliver the paper later in the afternoon. But on the weekends you had to get up early and deliver the paper so that when people came up with their cup of coffee the paper would be waiting for them. So I'd get on my 10 speed bike and I would ride through the neighborhoods and, and deliver the paper. And on this particular day, it was Easter Sunday morning. And my church happened to have a sunrise service. And, and the student ministry was kind of in charge of that service. We would present at it, and then we would do a pancake breakfast afterwards. And so it began at like 6 o'clock, so which meant we had to leave for church by 5.45, which meant I had to leave for my paper route at about 4.30 in the morning. And it also happened to be the Sunday of the time change. So 4.30 in the morning was really 3.30 in the morning. And I can remember as a middle school student for the first time in my life pondering like some of my life decisions, right? <laughs> like thinking like I've made some, some horrible mistakes and, and just in just this very immature sort of way thinking about like the whole idea of the daily grind and, and is this all that there is? Is, it, is the idea of just going out and having a job and getting more money, is this what it's about, and just my own sort of initial early stages way beginning to process this whole thing. When was that for you? See, we, we, we define a purpose for nearly everything that we do in life. It, it, I would say it's an expectation. And we feel, I think subsequently, we feel frustrated in the lack of that. Right? Remember that last like, business meeting you had at work that you were called in and you left wondering, like, why was I here? Like, what was the objective of the last hour of my life? Like, the, you, you, you feel that inside. There's something like, I just wasted it. I felt that when I took my kids to see the Emoji movie, right? <laughs> like, you're like, I will never get that hour and a half back. Like, I'm, that's gone. We feel that. For instance, if I were to say to all of you, I, I want you to meet me tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. at Navy Pier and not give you any information about why, what's going on, no reason for it, just say, hey, I, I, want, you to, I want you to meet me down there. I would venture to guess that for the vast majority of you, that would not be enough. There, there might be a few of you out of just sheer curiosity that might show up. There might be a few of you that, that, that just 
trust me enough to say, okay, I'll do it. But for the vast majority of you, you, you would want to know some aspect of why, some purpose and reason be, behind it. If you're going to take the time to make the hour, an hour and a half trip all the way down to Navy Pier to, to join me there at 6 a.m., you would want to know some purpose behind it. And in the absence of that, since we expect it, what we discover in life is in the absence of purpose, in the absence of meaning and what we're doing and what's going around us, when we feel like that's missing from us, there's this degree of anxiety in, in each of us that, that is there when our reality is, is missing purpose and meaning. With what, you, what I find compelling is that this is not a new question. We are not the first, as you might imagine, to wrestle with the idea that what is the purpose or meaning of life. In fact, it's actually an ancient question. It is in, it's one of the central themes of one of the Old Testament books, a book called Ecclesiastes. And at the outset of this book, the author of this book creates a, a character that's simply referred to as the teacher. And we're, we're introduced to the teacher at the very beginning, and and immediately the teacher makes a, or submits a thesis for consideration. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. This is his thesis. He says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's a, that's a, a dark, somewhat hopeless approach, statement there. What follows throughout the rest of this, this book is the teacher sort of systematically dismantling all of the ways that we look for or ascribe meaning and purpose apart from God. So it takes the topics of, of wealth and pleasure and achievement and career and status, and it overlays them with the reality, two realities, the reality of time and the reality or the eventuality of death. And it says in light of those two realities, all of those things that we look to, that we ascribe meaning to, they're all... It's all meaningless. In verse 17, it says it's, it's a chasing after the wind. In my experience as a pastor, and, and really I would say even my own life experience, I think we're more in tune to this question of, of life's meaning and purpose in, at two times. One is when we have ascribed, so okay, when I, when I achieve this level, when I get to this place, when my career is at this point, when I've done these things, then I am going to experience tranquility. I'm going, to, I'm going to be fulfilled, right? That is my meaning. That's my purpose. The problem is so oftentimes we arrive there and our sense of emptiness and our sense of hopelessness is, is, is no less pro, uh, um, pronounced. It's no less obvious to us. Or on the flip side of that, perhaps we recognize that whatever landing place we've ascribed meaning to We've been chasing after it so long that we, re we, we realize we're never going to get there. It's never going to be a reality for us. And so I guess I've failed. I guess life has no meaning. The second time I think it sort of comes home to, to resonate in our lives is when we are around death. Whether, whether it's our own failing health, whether it's, it's, it's the death or, or the illness of somebody that we love very dearly, when we have proximity to that, we have a tendency to ask these questions. In fact, Ecclesiastes, when he's talking about it, he, he, he sort of describes death as this great equalizer. So this then is what I would refer to as our human condition. This is our human condition, that, that we're left sort of wondering, looking for, longing for meaning, that there's this sense of frustration or emptiness in the absence of it. And in the absence of it, then we, we continue to search. It's this somewhat of a never-ending cycle. Believing, hoping, getting there, realizing that it's, it's not everything that we thought it would be. Tom York, who is the um, lead singer of a band called Radiohead, he was asked in an interview about this hope that uh, achievement, all that he had accomplished would provide purpose. And the way York describes it in the interview, he says it's just filling up a hole. All it is is filling up a hole. That's all it ever does, he says. The interview then asks a, a, a follow-up question, and he says, well, then what happens to the hole? 
And York responds and says it's still there. It never goes away. So I think this is, is a perfect description of this human condition. So the human condition then leaves us with, with, with what I'm going to call a human dilemma. Our human dilemma, our condition is that we're wired for meaning, for purpose, but our our dilemma is that in the emptiness of the pursuit, in the lack of, of satisfactory results, we ask ourselves, we're left with the question, where do I go for meaning? This, this brings us back then to this question that the teacher asked in Ecclesiastes. After, after saying that it's all meaningless and then taking all of these things and, and and looking at him through the lens of time and the eventuality of death, the author ultimately draws this conclusion at the very end of the book. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He says, now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the duty of all mankind. This is the purpose. This is the meaning. So I want, I want to come back to this a little bit. This, according to the author, is where meaning resides. So I, I want to take the next few moments to unpack this a bit and look at what I'm going to call the divine design. The divine design. And I want to look at this topic, this issue, through the lens or the perspective of a biblical worldview. And there's a couple of things that I want to highlight here as it relates to the way I process or understand or the way I think Scripture speaks in, the Bible speaks into this topic of meaning in a and purpose in our lives. And first, I think it's important to understand that purpose is rooted in creation. Purpose is rooted in creation. I think it's, it's difficult for us to really talk about purpose without first establishing it in creation. Timothy Keller, who's an author and, and speaker, pastor out of New York, he wrote a book called Making Sense of God, and he talks about two sources of meaning in our lives. He talks about what he calls created meaning, meaning that there is these sources of purpose for us that are, are not objectively out there. They're not, they, so we develop them, right? We, we create them. There's somewhat of um, um, personal and how we feel. And so for each of us, it might be my meaning, my purpose is that I, I want to have a happy family. I want to see my kids grow up and be healthy and strong and, 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 and a part of a a growing society, or we might have some political view or perspective that we ascribe meaning to and purpose, and so we chase after that with everything that we have, or we might, like we heard in the video, it might be about making the world a better place. It, it's somewhat, it's largely subjective, and it is wholly dependent on our feelings, Keller writes. But then he talks about a, a second kind of meaning, a discovered meaning. And this is meaning that comes from outside of ourselves. This would be an objective level of meaning. So if, and Keller writes, so if we were created by God, then there is an inherent meaning, meaning that we must accept. If we were created by God, there's something outside of ourselves, an inherent meaning that we must accept. So if you flip to Genesis chapter one, or I'll have this on the screen, but this is the the creation narrative and the description of God creating humankind. And this is what, what the author writes. He says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image and in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them, and God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I, I, I want you to hear from the very outset, when God is creating humankind, he, he embeds into it meaning, purpose, as a part of his creation. I think of it this way. My kids, I have three daughters, and when they were little, several of them got into uh, Legos. And they would get these different kits, and, and they would put them together. And, and what they're doing in that moment is they're the builder, right? Somebody else designed it. Somebody else created it. They just gave you all the pieces, and you build it. You follow the instructions. 
But inevitably, all these kits sort of get mixed up, and now there's just a big bucket of Legos, right? And so they, they create out of their own vision. And actually, this is what I love more, is, is when they just sort of take the pieces and put something together, and then they come and they say, Dad, look what I made. And you, of course, you can't tell what it is, because it doesn't resemble anything. But then they start to explain it, what it is and what it does. It was funny, one time, my, my youngest daughter had made something. I was like, what's, what's going on here? And she basically had created like a, a nightclub. I was like, we need to check your TV viewing habits. Like, it was like a dance floor and like a DJ booth and all this. I was like, what's going on on Netflix right now? And, and she could point me to each one of the different pieces and she could say, well, this is what this does. And why could she do that? Because she created it. Because the pieces of that Lego puzzle that she put together were hers to speak into because she was the author of its design because she intended what the purpose would be when she made it. See, what Genesis is telling us is he made us. And from a biblical worldview, therefore, he determines or defines purpose and meaning. This is developed further in the fact that when the, when the author describes this, he says not only did he form mankind, but it says that he formed mankind, it says in verse 26, in his image. It says in our likeness, talking about the Trinity. The, the German philosopher Martin Heidelberg, uh, I think, uh, notes astutely. He says, human beings are the only ones who, who wonder about the meaning of life. We're the only ones essentially asking this question. And I think Genesis 1 is pointing us as to the reason why. Because we, we were image bearers. Because we were made with a purpose and there's design in us. And unlike the rest, the, the, the rest of creation, you and I were created with the ability and really for the purpose, the capacity to know God and to be in a relationship with him. This, this, this then is our purpose, to know him, to glorify him. In the Westminster Catechism, when that was developed to first train people in the, in the foundations of the faith, and it, and it goes with a series of questions and answers. So children would learn this at a very young age. And the first question they ask themselves is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is simple. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To be in a relationship with him. So our, our purpose from a biblical worldview is rooted in, in creation and in God's design and intent. The second thing that I think is important in understanding this divine design is that purpose is possible through Jesus. Purpose is ultimately possible through Jesus. So the, the, the Apostle John, in John chapter 1, he, as he writes, he echoes the language or kind of the flow of Genesis chapter 1. This is, this is what he writes. These are the first four verses in John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made, and without Him, was noth was, uh, without him nothing was made that has been made, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So the Apostle John, when he is, in his account of the life of Christ, he echoes the creation narrative in Genesis and he describes the arrival of, of Jesus into humanity. And when he does so, he describes Jesus as the word. In the beginning was the word. That, that Greek word there is, is logos, from which we get our English word logic. But in the Greek, this conveys much more than, than mere logic or reason. The, the, the idea of the Logos in Greek philosophy was, was something of a divine first principle, if I can put it that way. Or said differently, it is the, the reason that gives meaning or is behind all other reasoning. So according to the Apostle John now, as the arrival of Jesus onto the scene, he says the one who was in the beginning was the Word, was the Logos, was the ultimate purpose has come, and he's come in order to bring us life, it says in verse 4. So as John is, is echoing Genesis, he's echoing this creation narrative here. 
And he says that our reason, our purpose for life is not some abstract set of principles. It's not, it's not some section of human philosophies, but it's a personal relationship with the creator God that is made possible through the person of Jesus. This is John speaking purpose in, into his story, into what he's accounting. Jesus himself, when, when he's asked this question, he's asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? which is really a purpose question. Jesus answers it in Matthew chapter two, uh, 22 this way. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This, this takes us back to what the author of Ecclesiastes told us what he was ultimately getting at when he says, when you, you, if you boil it all down, his conclusion was that it comes down to these things. He says, fear God, which is not, that's not a phrase that, that is indicating to be afraid of God. It's a phrase that indicates to know God for who he is. So it, it conveys with it, yes, a sense of fear when you understand his power and his might and his strength, but it's, it's awe, it's wonder, it's reverence, it's adoration, it's worship, it's, it's confidence in him, it's thankfulness, it's, it's love, it's all of that wrapped into a frame. He's saying, this is it. When it boils it all down, he says, know God for who he is and keep his commands. Or as Jesus puts it himself, as he defined it, loving God first and loving others, this is what you were created for. It's, it's why you are here. Finally, then, I think from a, a biblical worldview, and I'll, I'll just hit on this briefly, but I think from a biblical v- worldview, we, we look at, we try to understand purpose in view of eternity. We look at and try to understand purpose in view of eternity. A couple years ago, when we were going to take my daughters to Disney World for the very first time, of course, the little kids are looking forward to this, we were so excited and so what we did is we were going to tell them that we were going to do that the following summer at Christmas time. And they opened a package and there was like the sets of like Mickey Mouse ears and Disney t-shirts and all this sort of thing in there. And then as parents, we utilize this for the next six months, right? We, we, we utilize those six months to view the future through the lens of what was coming, th- through the perspective of what is ahead of us. Hey, this isn't how we're going to... We can't act like this if we're going to go to Disney, right? <laughs> and we do this at Christmas all the time. If there's any, you know, it, this is view your reality through the lens of what's coming. And this is, this is essential in the Christian worldview. Paul in, in Philippians chapter three, I'm going to just kind of hit on a couple of things here real quick. Paul, Paul describes this so eloquently, I think. He starts off in verse 10. And he simply says, I want to know Christ. So there we, we see, established, Paul says specifically his purpose, his desire, what he believes his life is about. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, participate in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. He wants to lay it all down to know Christ. But then when you look down in verses 12 through 14, he says, not that I've already obtained all this or, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, hear this, forgetting what is is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's saying, I want to live my life, I want to view it, I want to see it through the perspective with the implications of having eternity in mind. Essentially what Paul is telling us, and, and, and when we look at this question through the perspective of what the Bible teaches us on this matter, he's saying don't live as if this is all there is. Don't, don't live as if this is all that matters, but live with a perspective that, that sees eternity in mind. Live with, as Paul says, um, with the understanding and the view that you've been called heavenward in Christ Jesus. So this, this then is, is, is God's divine design. This succinct sort of explanation of that, that, that our purpose is rooted in creation. 
that our purpose is, is, is discovered, it's made possible to know and to love God through a relationship with Jesus, and then finally that it holds eternity in view. So as we wrap up, what do we, what do, we do with all of this? Where does this lead us? I would like to encourage you this week to consider a couple of, of things. First, I would like you to consider the question, what is your source of purpose? And, 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 and again, I acknowledged at the outset, we all have varying degrees of resolution when it comes to this question. But for me, as somebody who tries to live my life with the um, authority of God's word guiding me, I will tell you that there are some times in my life when I settle for secondary purposes. And what I mean by that is I forget that delivered purpose and I begin to live as if things that, that Ecclesiastes deal with, like success or, um, or, or, or status or um, wealth or whatever, those sort of creep back in. And so what I, what I would love for you to consider this, is, this week is what is your ultimate source of purpose? Is it, is it something you've created? And if it is, if it is something you created, how fragile is that? Or is it rather something that's been delivered? Is it something that comes from outside of ourselves, from someone greater, someone larger than ourselves? And then secondly, whatever you define that purpose to be, what are the implications of that? How does that purpose define your life? If, if you this morning were to grant me the possibility that God created you, then I would encourage you, I challenge you to wrestle with this divine design that we've been talking about today. I would encourage you and challenge you to, to wrestle with the, the implications, its effect of our sense of meaning and purpose. And, he, and, and perhaps just one point of application. Maybe read through, especially if you're wrestling with this question, read through Ecclesiastes. Read, read through, allow him, take in that thesis that he submits, the, the journey that he takes you on through all of these different areas, and see if you arrive at the same conclusion, that, that you were ultimately created to find your purpose in God. I believe this morning that, that we were created with a purpose and for a purpose. In fact, I would suggest that it's only when we live our life with the purpose of knowing God, of, of, of loving God and loving others, that we really experience the fullness of life. And I believe that this is what Jesus came to offer us. Every person was created to know and to love God personally, and our meaning is found in him. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this time just to um, process and wrestle just a, a very 30,000-foot um, view of, of purpose. You, your word speaks so much into this, especially when you start talking about your kingdom in the New Testament. But God, I pray that we would have honest conversations with ourselves and with others about where we get our sense of purpose. Lord, I pray that we would ultimately discover it in the one who created us in a relationship with you that comes that's possible through the work of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Before I offer this morning's benediction, I, I just want to remind you again, if, if you ever have a need in life or something that's going on, a situation, and you'd like somebody to pray with you, each and every week we have people available up front here just for that specific purpose. Um, or maybe something's great is happening and you just want to celebrate that as well. We'd love to just thank and praise God um, alongside of you for that purpose too. And they'll be available up here. You can come grab one of us. We'd love to pray with you, pray over you, or, or celebrate with you this morning. And now would you stand for this morning's benediction? Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, the one by whom our purpose is possible, to be in a relationship with you. May that be our experience, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Have a great morning.